Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Secrets for an Inspirational Life. I hope that you are all well today, wherever you are in the world. I hope there's a little bit of happiness and a little bit of joy, whatever you're doing. And, you know, sometimes in times when it's difficult, we often forget to look at the small things that bring us the greatest happiness, I think. And we really, really have to be very grateful that we are here on this journey called life and that we have an opportunity to meet other beautiful people and beautiful souls. And every single person that we meet, it is for a reason. There is no such thing as a coincidence, as they say. And today, I, I, I really have to say I'm very excited. I, I, you know, I was just saying to my guest, which I'm going to reveal who it is in a moment, I'm so honored to have him here and he's an absolutely fabulous guy and I'm very honored that he is here and that is the absolute genius that is David Courtney. David is a Grammy nominated award winning internationally acclaimed songwriter and record producer. He has, in fact, sold in excess of 33 million records worldwide and has worked with countless legendary names. And these are people such as Roger Daltrey, Sir Paul McCartney, Eric Clapton, David Gilmore, Jimmy Page, Hank Marvin, Gene Pitney, and many more. He is one of the unsung heroes, really, of music, because it is his work that has, I suppose, made stars of these people. And he is a legend in his own right. And during this lockdown, he has been very busy. He has used this time to bring about inspiration for one of his most brilliant and adventurous compositions to date called the Isolation Symphony, which he's going to tell us all about. Now, David does so many different things and has, you know, won acclaim for all his work. That is why I am so honored to have him here. And he also has an autobiography called Oh What a Life, what a wonderful title, coming out towards the end of the year. David is also part of the Walk of Fame, which is going to explain it in a much more eloquent way than I ever could. So without further ado, welcome, David. Good evening, Mimi. How are you? Good evening, David. I'm very well, thank you. And how are you? Yeah, I'm keeping well, thanks, but I'm, I'm pretty exhausted after hearing that, that <laughs> intro there. I feel tired. <laughs> do you could do with a little sleep now, yeah, couldn't I could you? Now. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but look, well deserved. You are a star, really. You're a genius in your own right. And I'm thrilled to have you here. I really am. And you have done Thanks. some amazing work. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you and talk to you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. Now, I have said a little bit, it's only a little bit about the sort of things that you do, but I'd like you to share with us and the listeners where it all started, to take it back. And where did this incredible life start with you? Well, it, um, it started in Brighton, which is why birth town that's where I was brought up I was very privileged to be brought up in such a fantastic place that was uh, still to this day it's like a it's a like a fun palace uh, city now as a city and um, it was a great playground for me as growing up as a kid and um, I um, I started out my music career restarted at school when I was about 13 coming on 14 with my best mate at school and we formed a band like so many others did and um I decided that I wanted to be a drummer I mean that that, that was funny in itself because um I used to drive my parents mad when I used to be bashing on the on the the kitchen mm. table with an 
all <laughs> to, the, to, to the records that I was hearing, and uh, that, that drove them insane. So uh, I, anyway, I, I felt I had rhythm in me. I knew that from the outset, and um, and 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 it was an exciting uh, venture that myself and my mate Peter Hall, his name was at the time when we started this out, he, he was a very clever kid. He, he could build his own, he, in fact, he built his own guitar in the woodwork shop at school, electric guitar, that is. And he oh, converted, a, yeah, amazing. And he converted a record deck into an amplifier. And I managed to blag my father into buying me <laughs> my first drum kit. And, and we were off and running and we started to form a former band and it, and it went from there. And, um, and then by the time, well, it went through different changes, that band, different members, as they always do, you know. And uh, mm. by the time I was sort of 16, I was professional. I was on the road in, in, in that same band with different members. And I was on the road and, and hardly ever used to see daylight when we we're up and down the, the M1 to doing various venues and clubs. And um, it was an, the most exciting journey, I mean, went into it not with the idea of oh i want to be famous or want to make money it was the hunger and the passion from wanting to to do music and mm. and even then as, as i say i was a drummer then i hadn't composed or even thought about it back in those days but um we were very fortunate that we uh, we were signed to an uh, an agency in london called the gunnel agency who um owned what was basically the most famous um, club in London for the music elite. And as I say, I was 16 at the time. And this was, uh, we were, we became the resident band at this venue. And what was so exciting about it is that every night the audience was made up of the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Walker brothers, the Kinks, the small faces. They were, it, they were the audience and oh I'm my this, goodness! Yeah, I'm a kid sitting on there playing the drums in this <laughs> band, and, um, and these were the guys. This is where Paul McCartney met Linda. This is the same club where they discovered Jimi Hendrix. It wasn't a very big club, but you know it was chock a block, and they were there all sitting at different tables and booths, and that was the audience. The club was was co-owned by the Gunnel Agency with Georgie Fame, so he'd be there every night sitting in the front table. As I say, I was 16 years of age, but um, if I, p I pinch myself now, I think, oh my God, you know, really, what I was exposed to at such an early age was incredible. Mm. The, mm. the grounding, the foundation work that happened, you know, in my career in that regard was was quite extraordinary. And um, my so the, that band continued on, and then and then at one point, that same agency came to us and said oh, we're, are you, would you be interested in backing you know, any artists? And we said, yeah, sure, you know, it's another another gig as far as we were concerned. Yeah. And he and the guy said, well, look, there's a, a guy called Adam Faith. You must have heard of him. And of course we have, you know. Um, mm. Well, he's parted ways with his band called The Roulettes and he's looking for a new backing band to go on the road with him. They're going to be doing a tour of Germany and, and, and other clubs. Um, we want you to go for an audition. So we went for an audition at the Ram Jam Club in Brixton. And um, as soon as he heard us, he, he offered us the, the job. And so very shortly thereafter, we were on the road. We were on the road to Germany, in fact, at that point, uh, to play all the GI camps across the um, in West, Western Germany, I believe it, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. And... And I was only about still 16, 17 ish then. And so that was my first introduction to him. Now, of course, like everybody, I, I know who Adam Faith was and grew up with that music with him and Cliff. You know, they were like the, the early pioneers of music in our industry. They were the first boys to, to crack it and became our pop stars, our equivalents to Elvis and mm. so forth. And, um, so we had always had the greatest respect for the likes of Adam and, and Cliff and, and the shadows, of course, were, were our big heroes. And um, so my association with Adam started then. His real name was Terry, Terry Nellums Wright. So to me, he'd always be Terry or Tell. And mm. that relationship with him 
continued on until the day he died. We were we were as close as brothers, um, or, uh, or maybe even closer. Really, it, it was an incredible uh, um, friendship, long long standing friendship. As I say, right to the day that he died. In fact, I was the one that got the phone call early in the morning when he he had his heart attack in in Stoke on Trent. Um, oh. So my journey with him, which is reflected a lot. A lot of this is reflected in my autobiography that we'll discuss a little later. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah, we became you know, very, very close. And we were in business together and and um, in the early days. And as I say, the friendship was extraordinary. So that early part of my career was all in, all, all that grounding was through that, being in that band and being a drummer. And then, and then at some point, I think it was about 1968, I... You know, it disbanded, basically, finished. And I came back to what I always called Sibby Street because my life from such an early stage, had, had, my whole life had been in, in music at that point mm. and, 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 and living and breathing with these other guys in the band. I, I wasn't really exposed to normal everyday life. So when I came back, and that's why I refer to it as Sibby Street, because, you know, I came back to a, a, a normality here and... Um, and so it was quite a quite a shock, but when I did, I um, and then I got married at a very early age uh, to my to my first wife at that point, and um, and I then started to self te- teach myself to play the piano. I had, my grandfather gave me a little upright piano, and um, and I would go to it every day and bash out these chords, not knowing of course what they what what the names of them were, but it all started to gel and make sense to me. And before I knew it, I was writing songs. And um that was the beginning really, where I'd like to say that was stage two of that journey of my career in music. And then and then we went on then I went on from there because I then wanted to go to the other side of the industry, discovering talent and and then uh, you know and promoting. So that it was a complete divorce from being a drummer. And um, yeah. I always say this, but, you know, as a drummer, you can't write very many songs on the drum kit, you know, so it's, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. for yeah. some reason I was blessed, I'm totally blessed in many ways, blessed with wonderful parents, blessed with health, of course, and mm. blessed with a talent. And, and that was the thing that um, I'm, I'm to this day always truly grateful for, you know. It is a blessing, isn't it, um, David? Because it is something I think, you know, we were talking, weren't we, the other day about Enya Morricone and uh, it, it's something inside of you, I think, that is, it's a gift that you can learn some things in life, but that's not enough, is it? it it's something deeper, on a deeper level, when you have the amount of talent, for example, of Morricone or of yourself because it's something that's it's like a divine gift oh absolutely isn't it well uh, most importantly I think as as a composer um where 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 the real gift comes in is that you 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 can touch people's lives people you'll never get to meet but you can touch their lives in de- various ways, whether it be a, a song that you wrote that, that, that relates to them when they got when they met each other, or when they got married, or on the mm. birth of a child, or or whatever. But the, the power of music is incredible, and and it is global. So if you are fortunate enough to have international success, which I've been very fortunate enough to have had, mm. you know it stretches right across the planet. You know, and um, and you and every now and again you get someone that will contact you and and say oh you know you, i was doing this when i heard that first piece of music that you wrote da 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 da, da. and you think this is this is unbelievable really this is such power <laughs> it is it's 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 like do. magic in a way of, of it really is it really to is touch and people on on such a deep level yeah and and of course i i i, love, I i've been fortunate enough and i've had success but when I look at the likes of people like my heroes, like the Beatles, when I remember Paul McCartney, for example, when I think and, and, and listen to what that man has achieved in his life there and what he's written is truly amazing. And, and it will never be repeated. I can't see this ever being repeated. Mm-hmm. To be honest with you. Mm-hmm. 
it's like a once in a lifetime. It's, I, I always, I, I always liken it to Elvis in the sense there will only ever be one Elvis. You know, some people come along in a century and yeah. it can never be repeated, that type of magnetism as well, like Freddie Mercury, for example. And um, mm. it, it's something that you can't, it's not explainable, is it? No, you can't bottle it, you know. Um, mm. And they are, what, what the secret of, of those sort of calibre of people mm. uh, is... Is, is that they are all individual and original. And so you, when you hear Elvis Presley, you know it's Elvis Presley. When you hear the Beatles, you know it's them. When you hear Freddie mm. Mercury, you know it's them. They've got a stamp and a, a branding on, on something that, you know, it's you know, others copy, of course. It's, it's natural. Yeah. But those originals, Little Richard, you know, any, any of them, they're, they're, that's why they are the superstars, because of that. Yeah, and there is a, a certain presence isn't there that yeah. captivates it's the power of music of course it's undeniable that it has the power to you can listen to something and it can take you to another world it can take you to oh, another yeah. emo emotion uh, you don't have to have words do you it's enough to have music wow well yeah exactly right and uh, and i've always been um uh, I've, all my writing has always been very conceptual, really. It's never just been the, the three-minute pop song. It's, it has always had this theatrical or dra drama around it, and, and that stems back from the very, very early days when um, Leo, as he became, I gave him his name, Leo Sayer. Um, uh, he was Jerry when I found him. Oh, really? he, uh, Oh yeah, Gerard say you know, yeah, he was in a band, and I held auditions, and I did what my uh, Simon Cow does now. I was doing it in Brighton back then. Uh, Brighton, you've got talent. I was, I, oh, I had a paper, and I had all these guys turn up for a, an audition, and um, uh, unfortunately, I made a, a mistake. I forgot to uh, say I was looking just for music talent, so I had people turning up doing farmyard noises and all sorts. <laughs> and it was it was a scream, but anyway, I I discovered him at that point, and um, you know we uh, we started writing writing songs together, and um, it was uh, then it really started to develop. And I had an enormous love for for circus when I was a kid. I used to, I was totally fascinated with circus. And Me too. <laughs> I, I used to sit glued to the television back in those mm. days watching a series that was called Circus Boy, which starred a, a young young kid uh, then. Uh, he was a young kid, blonde-haired, good-looking boy by the name of Mickey Dolenz, who became the drummer of the Monkees. And, um, and I would watch this every week. And, and when the circus did come to town, you know, I mean, it, in those days, I used to parade through the town with, mm. with the elephants and everything it was like it really fascinated me and that's what I, I loved by the way watching the the greatest showman because I thought he that he did a brilliant job on that and and he he captured all that and I thought that was that was wonderful and so that circus in, uh, influence really inspired me and that's when we wrote those early songs and and I was always the music man and Leo was always the the music the the lyricist and um Show, the show must go on. That's how it all came about. That was my inspiration. So I've always looked and and written conceptually. So that first album with Leah was very conceptual. We had an orchestration, so all sorts of things going on. And it's always, it's continued on that line for me. Uh, and even to this day with this latest um uh, album uh, Isolation Symphony has got a whole concept attached to it and and I like to take people into it I, wa I want them to engage them above and beyond just letting music wash over you I want to make you feel like you're there mm. and and again I write in that way I write visually so a piece of music that can give you that visual in your mind without actually seeing a picture if you if you understand but the music is the picture in fact i like to think now that what i do is i i paint with music that's really the way i look at it now how beautiful is that i i really love that explanation of putting something into words that really you can't put into words you know how can you put the universe 
into a word. It's impossible. But I've listened to that isolation, um, you know, album. And it, it's incredible. You know, we were talking about this um, the other day, you and I, and it really did take me on a journey to different places. So listening to different parts of the music transported me to, yeah. in a way, different parts of myself because I actually felt I was, as I said, I was in the desert and then I was somewhere else. I was at the mountains and it mm -hmm. just takes you on the journey. And I think this is what amazing talent like yourself, David, is that you are able to, in a way, take the soul on a journey. Well, that, that's it. I take myself on the journey. You know, it's like... Yeah. Uh, Exactly right. You're exactly right, and, I, and I'm and I hope that you and and all your listeners will will enjoy what I've created with this because it really, really, truly will take you through those what we've all been through here, which is quite unique, as, as we know, mm. and very strange and unique. But and and it's not a, a, a dark thing, you know. It, it's it is dark in, in what has happened to us, mm. but. By taking people through the through the through the lockdown, through into isolation, and then to eventual liberty, it, you know, it's, it's got a happy ending, you know, and and we're all looking forward to that happy ending. So, taking people on that journey and reflecting it in music is um, is the way that I've that I've created this, and um, that's uh, that's something I'm really I'm really excited about what, what what's coming out here, and uh, and and I think you were because you've only really heard those three small pieces of what yes. this is. I love when you, it. When you hear the whole thing and, yeah. and the atmosphere that's in there that you'll get, mm. because it'll take you through it. Um, and it's very, uh, it's, it's, I, I like to describe this, um, and, and then these are all people that have influenced and inspired me. It's, it's, a, it's a hybrid between uh, Pink Floyd, the Beatles and Massive Attack. There you go. There's three. There's just three <laughs> ingredients there that within the wash. Yeah. And um and yes and, and put it together again. As I said to you, it's a bit like you know painting with music. Is mm. you know you've got a palette and you've got colours and it's how you how you mix them up. You know everybody does it differently. And so this um this is something that I'm uh, I'm very proud of and uh, I hope everybody is going to like it. It is. They, I'm sure they will because it is quite exquisite. And I, I'll, I'll say to the listeners that you really have to listen to this because it takes you really on a journey and every single person will experience it as with all music in a different way. Now, I wanted to ask you, David, because this fascinates me. When you're writing the music, um, how do you do it? Is there a way, you know, do you wait for the inspiration to come? How, do you experience that journey yourself in order to then, you know, be able to write and take the listener somewhere? Okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you two things relating to that. One, one is that I've, wherever I've lived, be it here, America or Australia, you know, wherever, wherever I've got my room, studio, whatever you'd like to call it, I'm always conscious of, of having a room that doesn't have any windows because I find that a total distraction. And that, that room, I create my world in that room and it, I've got nothing around me to distract me. If I had a window in front of me, in front of mm. a piano you know, and I've got a window and a bird comes flying past and it, it lands on the tree, you know, it's, it's distracted me. So I have to create my world. And the best way of doing that is with, is, is in a room which has got no, uh, no, no windows. So that's the first thing. Now, a good example of, of that, and that helps me create that world. You know, I'm, I'm, it, uh, again, I, it's a bit like, a, I guess it's, it's like with Spielberg. He always used to say, Steven Spielberg, that mm -hmm. when, when he will create a movie, he's already made the movie in his head before he shot a piece of film. He's got the visual, he's got the, you know, it's in his mind, he's got it there. He can see the colors, he can see the, what the actions are gonna be. And I like to feel that it's very similar with what I do. Um, I, my, my, the way I, I often start is that uh, it can start with a rhythm, for example. And a good example of that you'll find interesting and i do talk about mm -hmm. this in my 
is that um, way back in 1976, I think it was, I um, I just been I just returned from France uh, where I'd recorded my what was my second solo album in a place called the Chateau of Hiroville, which became known famously as the Honky Chateau because Alton John recorded there and he called it the Honky Chateau. And it, it was a residential studio, so you'd go there and you know with your band and you'd stay there and mm -hmm. and 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 yeah, it was it was a fantastic experience. <laughs> I think it it was it which made it even more more of an experience. But anyway, when yes. I came back from there, um uh, and uh, I had the album and I'd sat there and I listened to it and I thought, well, I'm, you know, I'm not overly sold on what I've done here. I, there's something missing. It needs a couple of hits in this. And so I was always a big lover of ufology and I used to, you know, read about it and watch movies and things like that and um, mm -hmm. had quite a fascination for it. So this particular house that I had then in the country in Sussex, um, I had my studio outside in the converted garage. Uh, again, no windows, and I have to go out there at night and write. And this particular night, and this is just a good example for you, but this particular night, um, it was a very still night, and uh, it was about two o'clock in the morning, and I fell asleep. I fell asleep in the studio and was on my own in there. And I had the control room, which is where I was. And then there was the studio floor where they had a drum kit and things like that and the piano and all that. And um, I'd fell asleep and I, for some reason, I was woken by this really strange noise and, and it stirred me. And then the next thing I heard was this, the drum machine that I had, one of those very, very early drum machines, uh, which was sitting on top of the piano, started up and it started playing this rhythm. And I'm still in a sort of a zombie state and I went to it and I sat down at the piano and this rhythm, it, it was like, it was, I was engrossed with it. It was, it, it dragged me in and, and inspired me. And before I know where I was, my hands were, were going across the keyboard and I wrote the song Shooting Star, which was the first hit for the, group uh, English group called Dollar as you may remember mm -hmm. and give um, me back my heart is that is that Dollar that, they were that was one of their latest uh -huh. yeah, okay. I, I wrote Shooting Star and followed up by Who Were You With in the Moonlight which was the which was I wrote that at the same night so I was inspired by this complete freaky thing that was going on and this drum mm. machine you know and that song, Shooting Star, has got a whole journey that I talk about in this book that it goes from that moment and what happened to that song, other than it becoming a hit, of what happened to it when I went to America. And it was like an ongoing start. And it's the most incredible thing that happened there with it. And, um, but you'll have to wait. Oh, I thought, to yeah, that, that's going off. to be very yeah. interesting to read. Yeah. But it just and it just shows you how how something came about from uh, from a strange situation, but one that was turned out to be very uh, positive. And is do you think that these sort of I don't know what to call them really um, otherworldly or outerworldly uh, influences have actually inspired you in your music writing because listening to the isolation symphony it is a little bit otherworldly it takes you somehow to other realms mm -hmm. yeah um yeah again that's that that's often been the case with me um, and it has the same experience that i i know from mccartney and and even barry gibb where you find those you know where you your hands across the keyboard and then you think well and it all seems to gel and you can't work it out how did this happen and it seems to happen quite quickly and then mm -hmm. words can come out of your mouth and you think well where did that come from it's almost like there's a divine intervention of some sort here where there's or you're guided or whatever and inspired and it's that that's that's the thing that i found and it doesn't happen every time don't get me wrong i wish it did but mm. it seems to be that the times that it has happened to me they're the ones that have been the best and um 
And um, and as I say, um, McCartney often talks about how he uh, was inspired to write "Let It Be" from a dream and all that. So yes, I I do believe that. I do believe there is someone watching over. I really do feel that, mm-hmm. and it's mm-hmm. a privilege to have that. You know. And this is, I think, that all of us have some sort of a gift in life, but I think what, and I believe this, you know, and it's. Uh, a huge honor to be able to find that gift. It's within us, but it seems so difficult sometimes, you know, for us to actually become aware of it. Whereas you have become aware of it. And is it always something that you knew deep in your heart that you would do in your life? I was always the, I was always that kid, you know, Mimi, I was always that kid that was up to something, you know, I was always trying to invent something even from a young age i mean uh, just to give you a little clue i mean, i uh, and my my book this is the opening part of my book i talk about this and uh, uh, that um i i speak about uh, the, the chapter's called and and light does go out and what it was is as a kid again me up to my usual tricks i was on holiday with my parents in in a hotel in brussels i was about 10 8 8 9 10 somewhere around that age age group and i would play in hide and seek with these kids and we were in this basement area of this hotel and my parents were upstairs having a drink with some other friends I, did, I then decided, well, well I'm going to go and find a great place to hide that they'll never find me, you know. Uh, that would be me. me. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't just hide in the cupboard. I'd go and find something unusual. And sure enough, I did. I, I went behind this counter uh, this des- in this deserted basement area, and there was a, um, a refrigerator, and all the shelves had been taken out. And I thought, oh, this this looks like the ideal place. So I squeezed myself inside this refrigerator with my knees up to my chin and the door closed behind. And that's why I say the light does go out because I can tell you. And and before I knew I was, you know, I was sort of gasping for air and I... uh, and you can't you can panic but you can't move it was it was mm. horrific and uh my father who was I say upstairs with my mother uh, having having a drink had this strange feeling that there was something wrong and he said to my mother i'm going to go and find david see where he is see what he's up to and mm. for some other reason he walked straight down into that basement and straight up to that refrigerator and opened the door and i and, and then pulled me out he, how he knew, he, there was That's no remarkable, way. isn't it? It was remarkable. And I have to say that, because I say in the beginning, if it, if it hadn't from my, been for my father rescuing me from an abandoned refrigerator, I wouldn't be here today. And it's absolutely true. But I have to also say that I do believe that that experience, which as traumatic as it was, hmm. triggered something. I think it really did trigger something. Now, what that was, and, uh, and maybe that was something there that that led to where I, my journey has gone and take has, has taken me. But there was something about that experience. I guess you could say it was a near death experience, and mm. and that that obviously has always stayed with me. And that's why I use it right at the front of the book because. I feel that that's really where my journey started, not from when I was born or, you know, growing up, playing outside with the kids. It was that moment, that moment stayed with me. And I think that's where it all began. And how how old were you? I think I must have been about nine. To thinking back on the year, about nine years of age, eight eight or nine, somewhere in in that region there. Um, as I say, you know, I was always a kid up to something. I'd be always the one organising the, the, the cowboys and Indians and, and, and all these different things and the firework night and all sorts. Um, so it's always been in me. And, and of course, my parents were always on their guard because they think, well, what is he going to come up with next? What's he going to do next? You know, falling off of his bike. He's done this. <laughs> he's done that. You know? Yeah. I was a bit of a just William, I guess, in that way. But. Hey, it's just the way I was made, and, this, and I've always been that that create that creator in that way. You know, I've mm. I've never never settled really, and I don't know if I ever will, to be honest. I don't think you ever should, because it no, I it, don't know. It, it's it's that um, what makes you that 
you know, spark that makes you unique. Mm. Like all of us have this remarkable spark that individually it is something that only we possess. And that's where, you know, our gift comes in. But it's a very young age, maybe, you know, do you think it's because you brushed with death at such an early age that it made you um, live in a very different way? Yeah, well, I'm a believer in fate, I think, you know. Yeah, I think it's all marked mm. down, really, for how how, how things are going to uh, pair out, you know, how they're going to mm. roll out. Um, and uh, I think that, obviously, I wasn't meant to, to go then uh, uh, yeah. because there was there was a mission to be... <laughs> To, to, to go on here and, and to something to be achieved that, and who knows uh, I still don't know to this day what you know what maybe that that might be but is it going to be something above and beyond just writing the piece of music or well, I'd like to think that what I'm doing right now with this isolation symphony is that I'm sort of documenting what, what has gone on here and but but presenting it in a in a pleasurable way for, for people and hopefully for those down the line will look back on and can reflect on that and say listen th- if you listen to this this will tell you what it really was like you know mm-hmm. you can there'll be a million and one documentaries but i don't think there'll be a million and one albums that will do what i'm trying to do here so um hopefully you have got something yes. a little bit mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. indeed it is a symphony it is a symphony and it, it, it is a symphony but not in the orchestral term yes. of symphony. it's uh, mm. Yeah, it, it, it's one of those sort of seamless, you know, where it's mm. where the where the, where the where the songs intertwine, you know, where where you you sort of cross fade and you go from one to the other. And the best example of all, and, and I'm a huge fan, is is Pink Floyd, and I had the mm. privilege of working with David Gilmore and I'm still friendly with him. Um, so I used to go to their shows, and I was always fascinated by what they used to do. They, they were totally unique. So that was. There was something they were. They were quite different, weren't they? Oh, in everything that they did was sort of legendary. Yeah, it's very, very theatrical, and that's mm. what I've always loved. Mm. You know? Yeah, I love all that. The theatre of the mind, as we call it. Yeah. Yes, yes. It's a little bit. I don't know why, but I always liken them to Salvador Dali for some reason. Yeah. There's surreal, some sort yeah. of same. Yes, the surreal part of it, and that thread of this dream-like world that yep. Um, yep. that they emphasize somehow and and produce those feelings within us of that and tell me David this isolation symphony and I actually really love this this title as well because I think it sums it up uh, as a whole mm, how did that come about it came about literally from, well, let me say, first of all, through this terrible traumatic thing that we've all gone through here, um, mm. which has been truly life changing. And I think we're going to see more of that become apparent. Um, for me, it wasn't um, a, a, a major um, thing in terms of affecting my life because I I live in the country and I work from home and I write from home. So isolation didn't really uh, occurred to me you know that this was my normal day so to speak so um i uh, i didn't suffer it like many others you know the people that are living in apartments that couldn't go out and, and like that, you know terrible and w- what i did feel though is that i would sit and watch and observe what was going on here through the television and and you know especially with the likes of the nhs and all the things that were going on in the world not just with the covid problem but generally the world in turmoil and again i reflect a bit of that in this this album because there's been other things going on above and beyond the covid you know the world is in in a bit of a turmoil so um i would be very inspired by that or i was very inspired by that and, and i felt that the natural instinct was i want to write and it inspired me to write and i didn't have a blueprint print of like, I am now going to write this symphony and mm. that sort of thing I started and as I started it and and again that visual and that theatrics of it came into play and I could see this developing as I was going I felt now this is this is more than one song here this is more than even two songs this, this is an album this is an album and if I can 
use the likes of Floyd to 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 be my uh, inspiration to take this in that sort of direction. That's where mm. I'm going to go with, and, that, and that's how it developed. And um, I started off with using three very edited down versions of, of of three songs from the album, which you've heard, and yes. stitch stitch them together to give this sort of very short little symphony idea, uh, a taste of it, and and um, and I uh, I went and I approached the uh, NHS the charities together, and um, I said, "Look, I'm going to put this out, and I really want to do this, and I want to do it for you, and I'm going to donate all the proceeds from this single to the charity." And they they were thrilled, and we entered into a partnership agreement, and and that single is out there, and um, anything that it earns will go to them, and. Um, and it's, it's cost 99p to download the track. I mean, it's nothing money, is it? But, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know um, what a galon thing to do. What a wonderful thing to do, David, really. Wow. Yeah, I felt that, you know, it was mm. watching those watching those people in the front line. They were our, they were our soldiers, you know. They mm. are our mm. soldiers. You know. you know, if one has to liken it to what happened, what our parents went through in World War II, which was really probably a lot worse than this, you know, because they had bombs falling on them, you know, this is not funny. So yeah. um, those boys that were in those trenches or in D-Day and all that, and what they went through, there's the equivalent with the NHS, you know, these people are frontline people and, and without them, well, I don't know where we would be, really. Very true, very true. And I think I have realised, uh, I'm sure that other people also have their own realisations through this time. For me, in fact, I don't know about you, David, it was like really being in a war of um, a situation where you it was a hidden type of enemy. But one thing that I sort of awoken to was how many people really were putting their lives out there and at risk for us this was yeah. an incredulous feeling of somehow that there were these brave people out there you know fighting for us in a way wasn't it Oh, absolutely. Uh, as I say, you know, without them, I don't know where we would be. And as you, mm. you say, that unknown enemy, or in fact, you know, track two on this album, it's called The Invisible. And, and that's, that's exactly what it was. You know, it's, look, it's taken everybody by complete surprise. Uh, you know, it's all very well having a pop at a government, but really uh, there, was no, there was no rehearsal here. They didn't know how they were going to handle what they've had to handle here. It's, who, who would have been able to handle it? I mean, it, they had to, I think they made a lot of it up as they went along because what else yes. could they do? They, there was no manual to, to refer to to say all this. You know, I mean, you have to go right away back to the Spanish flu, I think is probably the only comparison from what I understand. Um, and, and of course, that was, that was so far ago, you know, I can't mm. remember that. So um, um, it's uh, to, 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 for people to come forward and be in that front line to help us through this and still are is uh, is um, is amazing. And I, the, the the thing that this has also done, and and I, I often think about this is that although mm. we've experienced isolation, it, the isolation has actually brought people people closer together because people mm. were. You know, they had to talk to each other and they were at home together and the, the family unit was there. You know, mm. there was no escaping it. And, yes. and, and then technology with, you know, we, we, we're communicating through technology and we're, it actually has brought people together. So it has been truly life-changing, this. It is, and I think that um, it continues to be uh, in so many ways. I was talking to a yeah. friend of mine and she owns a hairdressing salon with her husband and mm -hmm. she said to me that it was just her and her husband and her family at home but when she started work last week I think it was Saturday she said she didn't know what to say to the people her clients when they came in and she said <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes 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 and she said exactly that and she said do you know what Mimi she said I didn't have a clue what to say to anyone. And I said, what do you mean? I said, that's your job. She said, I was so used to not really talking to people yeah. that somehow mm -hmm. I'd forgotten. And she goes, and when my first client came through the door, she said, I started crying because 
I thought to myself, where have you been? I've missed you. You know, and yeah. there's this, this, as you say, you know, this humanity, this, this touch of the human, this, uh, that I suddenly felt, I know you have those moments, don't you? Like, right. I suddenly thought, I love everybody because we're all part of this great, you know, moment of infinity, aren't we? Oh, oh yes, well, absolutely. We? Well, you know, it's um, the other thing that it, that it has done is um, it's shown how vulnerable we are because we, yes. there's, there's a, there's a com common enemy here that that, um, that we've all had to... Uh, globally come together and you know it just shows you how vulnerable we are and if this if this was uh, i mean you feel like you're living for a bad movie here somewhat mm -hmm. um if, if this was uh, as you've seen portrayed in many science fiction films uh, the, the, the this was an alien race attacking us and, mm. and maybe this is the way they would do it. All they need to do is plant a virus. You know, they don't need to fire a bullet. Um, and you can see how it would just take us out. Now, that shows you how vulnerable we are and how it is a wake-up call here. I do believe mm. a lot of this is a wake-up call. And you know, from the pollution, you know, all of that whole thing. Of, of, of how it cleaned up the, the, the world here through, um, through you know, the, 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 no cars on the road and pushing out fumes and stuff. Um, it, it's, it feels like some sort of intervention and um, mm. uh, be it whether it's man-made or whatever, I, we don't know. But what I do think is it, it does show our vulnerability and uh, all the more reason why we need to take note here because this has got a little way to go, yeah. And also, you know, know what's coming in future, but now we should learn from this and, and maybe people's attitude will change. We hope, we hope that that yeah. is something that will become a reality. But I do believe, I, I totally agree with you, David, because somehow it is an awakening for humanity in on a large scale. And... Mm -hmm. You know, I've spoken about this before with several of my guests and it's like when people, you know, when people want to achieve a higher spiritual state or a, a way of understanding profound wisdom, they put themselves into a seclusion for a period of time. You know, the Buddhists did it, you know, the Sufis did it, you know, many people did this of totally you know, for example, like yourself in the room with no windows. Uh -huh. And it's at those points, I think, in life that are hugely transformational. And it, it, in a way, by putting us, all of us, as globally, as human beings, into a seclusion, so to speak, I wonder if it's preparing us for something really far greater than we could imagine could, could, could well be could well well be um i was just thinking as you were talking there that i, I forgot to mention that the i've taken it one stage further uh, uh, from an album that's going to be a, there's going to be an lp book and i've joined forces with a, a lady a, a wonderful uh, talented uh, award-winning photographer called Vanessa Champion and she takes the most wonderful monochrome pictures and went to her with the concept of saying look here, this is going to be the album although she hasn't heard it yet I've got to say no one's heard it um, but just from describing it and just hearing that single and mm. I said to her look that I'd love to create something here where we put um, images to the music and that, um, uh, and we and we create a book that's going to come uh, with this album. Uh, uh, well, there'll be the album will come out, and then this book will come alongside it just a little later. Mm -hmm. And also in that same book, I, I thought, right, I'll take it uh, yet yeah, another stage further, and I contacted a dear friend of mine in America called Stephen Kalinich, who is a, an American poet and lyricist, as well a lot with the Beach Boys and mm -hmm. we've been great for many years and I said to him look Steve and I explained what I'm doing and I talked about Vanessa's involvement and I said I love to see these sort of four line verses that can go uh, in you know uh, in um, pages next to the, some of these photographs when we're taking people through that journey from lockdown through I 
isolation liberty uh, oh. and so you pick and then you've got these fantastic photos and then you've got little four line verses which are wonderful and that's coming out with it so it's taken it again to another level here so that's really exciting and i'm really really pleased about that that's that's going to be something quite special that sounds actually yeah that sounds magnificent actually david mm. because it is in a way uh, i don't know it's the holy grail isn't it of life of finding the meaning of life and what it seems that from the conception of the isolation symphony to the book to your friend doing the poetry yes. and everything yeah. it's mm. a complete sort of revelation in itself yes. about life isn't it absolutely it's, you know look, this this is a very important landmark, landmark in time of what, what we're uh, in here, um, uh, and, the, and that opening lockdown song, as you mm. you, you, you may recall, there's a there's a, a sort of a news uh, brief, uh, a, a bit of a speech there from the mayor of New York, and he talks about it as a as a history. It's going down in history as a real true crisis, and uh, and it's that sort of thing, you know, that, that the drama of that that we've lived through here that I felt needed to be reflected here and inspired me no end to, to write write for this you know so uh, and what so, are and you I planning think, what are you planning I, now to do what well, you just stay, stay in there for one second um if you would like when uh, the time is approaching and this album is going to come out we can revisit our, uh, our discussion on your podcast and we can play this album and we can walk through it Together, oh yes, can, yes, that would be absolutely yeah. fabulous. It'll mean we have to stop uh, after tracks and be able to talk, but otherwise we'd be sitting there for forty-five minutes with no no talk. But um, no, we can walk through it, and I think that would be a lovely thing. And and uh, and then Let's do the it. feedback would be mm. yeah, so something we could do together. Absolutely, absolutely, sounds like a fabulous idea. Actually, yeah. a real sort of mystical journey in yeah. you know that you're going to take us on oh absolutely let's do that yeah i will do that that that's amazing really amazing and i love this spirit of yours david where listening to that music of yours it was moving but also it was somehow a reflection of what was going on inside of me. And I find that really incredulous because to be able to do that as a songwriter and, you know, as a composer, it does take a certain type of divine magic, doesn't it? Yeah, I'd like to think so, yeah. Although, you know, I... I it's sort of a bit out of my control, even though I'm the one creating it. I do feel that I've, I've freed it out a channel here and allowed to cast myself to the wind, so to speak, and let it all come through. And 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 then you really, it's a matter of filtering, saying, "Oh, that that sounds good, and that feels good, and that doesn't." And you know, so um, yeah, I've, as as we talked about earlier on, I think there's maybe more than me just involved here somehow. I'd like to think that's the case, anyway. Yes, for sure. And what about, I wanted to ask you something actually about when you have collaborated with people and all these, you know, great musicians and, you know, with your great work and singers, what does it take really to have a really good, you know, mix of um, talent that you know in your self that this is actually going to work really well do you have a feeling about that yeah when when you're when, as a producer putting those albums together if uh if it called for uh you wanted certain you had an idea what you used to call it is like your wish list you know of, mm -hmm. uh, who would you like to say on this record and uh and you know we'd always have that and um then, then getting them was it was another whole um a whole story but um i mean a, a good example of that would be when i was doing my debut solo album which was called david courtney's first day because it was to me my first day out as far as a, an artist was 
concerned, being an artist. And um, I co-produced it with a, with a good friend, a guy called Andrew Powell, who had already produced the likes of Pilot and Kate Bush. He did all that stuff with Kate Bush. So he, he, he was, a, and he was a, an arranger uh, and musician himself. And he, he would be able to arrange and conduct orchestras and it's fantastic. So when I sat down with Andrew and I would say, okay, there's this song, I've written this particular song, which I think, um, again, it's very Floyd. It was a song called When Your Life Is Your Own. And I said to him, you know, th this is very Pink Floyd and I'd love to see David Gilmore play on this, thinking no, there's no way this is going to happen. <laughs> so Andrew said, oh, that's fine. He's a friend of mine. I'll phone him. I thought, well, this is, this is, this is going to be good. <laughs> uh, he phoned him. And as it transpired, it was something I didn't realise until many years later. This was the first album that David Gilmore ever guested on. So... So I was a piece of history that I'm the first person he ever played outside of Pink Floyd that he guested. Wow. So, but I remember when he, um, he was coming to the studios, we were, we were recording in Air Studios in London, which was owned by George Martin, the Beatles producer. And, mm -hmm. and uh, David was going to come after his gig. And the gig that he was doing that night was with Pink Floyd at Wembley, The Dark Side of the Moon. And he came straight from that concert with his roadie and his equipment. And he arrived at the studio about, I don't know, 11 o'clock at the evening or midnight. And we sat through the night there playing and um, recording the song. And, and that was like, well, you can imagine. It's, it's, it's those moments that you get like that. They're, you know, they're, oh, do you know what? And we never used to film anything. We never used to take a picture. You didn't have all the mobile phones then. You, mm. know, unless you had a brownie or something. You know, we never even gave it a thought. And I wish now, especially when I'm doing this autobiography, I thought, oh, it's a shame. I haven't got a picture of that moment. <laughs> what a shame. What a shame. Oh. oh. Oh, it is a shame. But anyway, well, it may, well I had, the only way around that is that I talk about it and you listen to the piece of music. And then I guess between the two, it will give you some sort of image in your mind. But yeah, that working with those sort of people, um, and I've had quite a few of those along the line. Um, uh, and, and as a producer in particular, you know, when you're working with musicians, and I've always mm. found the best way of getting a performance out of people is giving them the freedom to express and not dictate to them, oh, I want you to play it like this and you've got mm. to do this and you've got to do that. You let them go and you let them express and they'll deliver something for you and many, many times they'll come up with a gem that you, you, you'd never have even thought of because you've given them the freedom to express. And that's the, the way I've always Yes, been. yes, the space the space for totally, yeah, you know, the soul like, to be free mm. absolutely yeah absolutely mm. so, and, and it's always worked that way so i've been very fortunate with, with that and oh it's happened a number of times so uh, always the better way i've been so yeah it's absolutely wonderful to listen to you speaking david because it it's like a walk through history as well and some really poignant moments and you've really done some amazing things. And one of the things is that you are the founder of the Walk of Fame, aren't you? Yes, that, that all happened from when I was, I was living in Los Angeles. I moved mm -hmm. to LA. I always wanted to live in America um, at that point in my life. And, um, and Leo and I were recording every day in a studio called Sunset Sound and, we had, oh, the, the, the musicians that we had on that record were unreal. I mean, that's when I got to work with Steve Cropper, uh, who, who wrote, well, played on all those records like Knock On Wood, and um, he wrote My Girl, or, uh, and, oh, and, and okay. you know his... And he was the original, him and Duck Dunn were the original Blues Brothers. They were Otis Redding's backing band, and we had them there, and we had Booker T, because they were in the Booker T and the MGs, and... These were these, these guys, so working with them was un unreal. So every day I would walk to the studio and I'd be walking along Hollywood Boulevard there and, and I used to be fascinated with the, uh, the Hollywood Walk of Fame and I thought to myself, God, you know, 
we're not very good at doing this in England. You know, we don't have anything like this. We, we keep a very low profile and, you know, we don't shout from the rooftops and yet we've got so much to be proud of and, and, and we should be shouting about it. And I thought, and I just expressed it to Leo. I said, you know, I do go home eventually. I'm going to have an idea back to the UK. He thought I was mad. And, uh, <laughs> and it has I did return to England and, and I did and I managed to trademark it and uh, Hollywood were, were straight on on at me saying you can't do this we own the Walk of Fame and I said yes you do in Hollywood but you don't own it in this country because I do now <laughs> and they were quite taken back by that and um, anyway we came to an agreement whereby the, as long as I didn't um, copy their star in design mm. that, um, that, that was, there was nothing else they could do about it and um, the first thing that I uh, discovered and, and adopted was that I thought, right, I'm going to start this off in my hometown of Brighton because Brighton's always been known for being associated with the rich and famous. A lot of artists and, uh, you know, the theatrical artists, uh, like a Lord Olivier, who I, who I had the privilege of getting to know uh, down, down in Brighton. Um, people like him, the calibre of these people is unbelievable. Oh, so thought, wow. Now there's the Hollywood of England. I thought, well, I'm sitting in the middle of it. So mm. What better place to start this? So um, yeah. what I did, I, I, I discovered which a lot of people don't realize is that the, uh, the Hollywood Walk of Fame charge the recipient. Now it's gone up to $30,000 for having a plaque. Oh, really? And yeah. And that bill is usually picked up by a, uh, the, the, the movie company or the record mm -hmm. company or whatever. And, and I thought, well, there's no way that I'm going to be introducing that idea into this country because I think it makes a mockery of what, it, what it's supposed to be. Mm. And, um, and, um, and so I thought, no, the community of Bride and Hove, as it was then, um, should be the people to vote, nominate and vote who they w wish, wish to see on it. And, um, and so the, it was voted for by the people and they've kept that constitution running throughout and, and every walk of fame we've done so far and and it was truly recognized by those recipients when we had our launch and i remember it so clearly uh, we had that uh, we'd inducted a hundred names from right across the spectrum from sport like chris eubanks and uh, sally gunnell because they all had a close association with brighton that was the, mm -hmm. that was the key so they had to be closely associated so you had them and you had um you had like, uh, Roger Daltrey was there, the who, yeah, Leah was doing a live performance for us. We had uh, uh, a guy called, um, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember his first name now, but Herbert, he was, um, he was uh, the uh, author of many books. Even people like, do you remember Alexandra Bastido? She was in the original Champions. The yes, yes, I remember. I remember and her God. name. So she was there and, Anyway, it was a total cross section of people, and and I remember th th them saying to me, you know, they would never get normally never get to meet each other, and it, I brought them in under this one umbrella, under this walk of fame. That's how they all got to meet each other. Des Lynam was another one, total cross section. So it was a truly colourful night, and um, and I remember one of them turning around and saying, you know, this is a real accolade because we know that the public have voted for us. It's not been some quango committee that has put us on here. It's the people that have voted for us. And so they, they recognised it and acknowledged it as that. And I thought, well, that's job done right there. You know, that, that, that's, I couldn't wish for, for more than that. I thought, that's wonderful. And so we've adopted that and taken that forward ever since. So uh, it's been... Um, that's been another whole journey. It's been a second sort of mm. line, line to me. It started off as a hobby and then it became a full on business. And we, uh, we launched the football walk of fame in Manchester. And there's a, a big music walk of fame that's now been launched in London, which we license in. And again, the who were, were inducted into that earlier this year, alongside madness and, Amy Winehouse and that and that's uh, that's going to be an enormous one that one uh, in Camden is from Chalk Farm at one end all the way to Mornington Crescent the other it's it's incredible what they're doing there uh, and, and it's all interactive now with augmented reality it's, it's taken on a whole new life 
And the one that's really, uh, I'm really looking forward to, that mm-hmm. we're in right now, is the Bollywood Walk of the world's first Bollywood Walk of Fame. Oh, my like goodness. That? That's amazing. Yeah. How, how did yeah. you get the idea for that? Oh, because I recognised um, the, the following that that has. Uh, not that mm-hmm. I could name any famous actors to you, but um, I thought, yeah, it's got such a, a following here that, and when they have the Diwali festival every year, you know, it's, it's quite massive. I thought this has mm. got to be reflected. So I thought, right, this is one that we should definitely be doing. And it's been a, 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 a bit of a mission of finding the right location for it. But uh, I know it's going to really work because the people that will follow this be incredible. Oh, it, it you know, I didn't realize until a few years ago, David, I've actually how big the Bollywood industry is, in yeah, fact. Huge. Yeah, it's huge. It's huge, isn't it? I, I, was, yeah. I was shocked. And the amount of films and things that they make, and oh. I'm actually a fan, I have to say, and I can't remember the names, but I know the faces, and I probably yeah, won't pronounce them properly. But exactly. um, they're all so lovely looking also, aren't they? Yeah, it's so, so colourful. So, yes. you know, I'm looking forward to seeing that launch night when that happens. You can imagine with all the, uh, oh, the, the, yes. the, the whole thing going on there and the colours. and the, Yeah, it would be magnificent. So, mm. so that's something I'm looking forward to uh, to experiencing, I have to say, to see that that's, that That's your circus, isn't it? That sort of very, yeah, th- exactly. there is a circus exactly. feel to that, it, isn't it there? It seems to come back to that, doesn't it? Yeah, yes. it does. <laughs> seems to come back to that there's something in there who knows what that is maybe i was maybe i was a circus master or something in another life i don't know a ringmaster yes i i was absolutely i have to say fascinated as a child with circuses and i actually had packed my bags when i oh, was like very the, young like the elephant <laughs> yes 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 absolutely and I was ready to go and um, I packed my bags. I think I was about five. I remember it very well because I had this absolute obsession with the circus and Mm. I would sit on the wall, you know, we lived on a farm and I would sit on the wall with a friend of mine and we'd had our bags packed. Nobody knew this, but only, you know, me and her knew about this and we would wait and hope, you know, the circus to come into town and to take us. Yeah. We didn't know what job we were going to do, but we decided that this was the best course for our life was to join the circus. Well, it was always the, the, the big escape, wasn't it? You're going to run away yes. to the circus. You're going to yes. run away to the circus. I mean, that was a kid's dream, wasn't it? Yeah, amazing. I know. I think it's still my dream, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Somewhere deep down, I still yeah. have that sort of... I think it's this also this um, free-spirited. It, there's something very free about a circus, isn't it? It's the people that are like, you know, like, um, I don't know if you've ever been to the, uh, in Spain near the Alhambra where you have the gypsy community, which is oh. very, very free and um, yeah. sort of very artistic and very passionate and, I don't know. It's sort of a little bit of what dreams are made of. Yeah. Mm. yeah. That's the general side of life, isn't it? You know, which is yeah. total, uh, uh, opposite to some of the terrible things that go on. You know, we need, just need more of that now. That's, that's it. Yeah. Hopefully we we'll, more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, more to say this out of this darkness that we've come through here that maybe we're going to see some more of the thing. I think you're already seeing it on the television with people coming together, inventing different things, you know, and doing their things remotely. And uh, yeah, yeah. So hopefully it will, it will continue. Yes, I, I have uh, a great faith in that and a belief. And I feel also that all of us collectively, whatever we're doing, to find our purpose for being here on this planet is and have the courage and the bravery to pursue that so that we can make a difference. Now is the time, you know, to try and make that difference in the world for ourselves and for those around us. And for the next generation, Mm. most importantly. Mm. Yeah. 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 Now, David, what inspires you? Who inspires you in life? Who inspires me? Mm. Well, obviously, 
your, your, your children inspire you because uh, you mm-hmm. know you're you, a reflection of you and um and what you've created there is something you know that money can't buy so it's it's uh it's uh something quite unique um i i've got a wonderful one who who uh, who inspires me and supports me and um and participates in my vision, you know. So, so when you share a vision and all that, you know, that's that's something very special. Um, and then, you know, as I say, artistically, uh, there are you know those artists out there that you know that I've mentioned earlier on that I've always been very inspired by. That I get inspired when I watch certain films. I can tell you, I tell you two two of my favourite films that you probably don't know about. Mm. Um, well, you should if you don't know. Um, one was with Robin Williams, uh, the the late Robin Williams, called uh, "What Dreams May Come." I don't know if you've ever seen it. You should. I have. It. I you've love never that seen film. It. Yeah, it's something quite special. We're Gooding mm. Junior in it, and the other one, which uh, this this guy, um, I've always loved his work. There's a, there's a man called Albert Brooks. Now. The name's not probably not ringing about you, but again, if you no. saw him, you you think, oh, I've mm. seen this. Yeah. And um, he did a, a collection, of, a, a number of films. They're usually sort of comedy dramas, but there's one film that he did with Meryl Streep, which was never a big box office success, but it's probably one of my favourite movies of all time, and it's called Defending Your Life. And if you've never seen it, watch it. No, because, I haven't. Oh, it's it's it's. He wrote, he writes, produces, and directs this man. He, he's something mm-hmm. incredible. But the storyline of this is basically, you know, he leaves this, this place through an accident and goes to what is basically a waiting station where you're going to go and be judged to determine whether you go forward or come back. And the way it's done and the humour that's around it and mm-hmm. the relationship with him and Meryl Streep is something quite extraordinary. So if you've never seen it, try and see if you can get it and watch it because it'll really, it'll make you smile. It'll make you feel like, God, oh, well, I hope this is the case. I hope this works this <laughs> way when the time comes because the, the place that they go to is almost like Las Vegas where it looks. Um, <laughs> when you can eat anything you like and you don't put on any weight, you know, while you're there, you can do participate in it. <laughs> It's, it's, it's quite incredible. <laughs> and it's called watch. what? Defending it's Your Life? Defending Your Life, yes. Okay. Albert Brooks. Albert, Albert Brooks. Brooks. Yeah. Okay. And Meryl Streep is actually yes. one of my favourites. So, yeah, um, she's, she's very good. And, and they, 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 all those sorts of things inspire me because, uh, and, and uh, you know, you get those certain movies and there are only a few in life that you mm. think I can watch time and time again. The, there aren't too many now because we're flooded with it on the television. And so yeah. those ones that are your favourites like that, you, you know, you never get tired of looking at them and I always find it inspiring every time I do watch it. Yes, I, I have a couple of those as well. One of them actually is with Robin Williams and it's, um, have you seen it? It's Awakenings with Robin Williams. Have you seen that film? I'm not too sure. Who, who else? Uh, Robert De Niro and Robin Williams and it's about um, a doctor who discovers a cure for Ah. a disease you know where they're in the uh, hospital and they're sort of asleep but they're not really asleep and he discovers this new drug and gives them a moment of life there you go yeah I think I I I, I recall seeing this but I don't think I ever watched the movie but I will do now you told me oh you must you you must you will enjoy it for you know for sure because I've watched it I think over 200 times and it's just you know parts of a movie David where you actually um keep replaying and there's there lines of a movie that in life it sort of it gives meaning to life some sort of lines like i don't know scent of a woman for example with al pacino have you seen that one at all yeah i think i saw that one yeah and 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 also as good as it gets with jack nicholson oh that was that was that was interesting film yeah he's a good actor he's a he's a bit i don't know i find him sometimes a bit scary i have to say oh yeah he's definitely that (laughs) (laughs) but at the same time a bit intriguing (laughs) <laughs> when I was living in Los Angeles, he lived uh, up in the canyon from me, and mm. he would use the same 
supermarket and come down in his dressing gown and be parading around the the, the, the aisles with a oh, really and, oh yeah I mean literally lived up to what he, what he is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh funny. my goodness, that must have been an experience and a half. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> Do you talk about any of this in your book? Yeah, well, there's that, and there are a lot of untold stories that, I'm, that mm. I've got in this book that are going to be uh, quite an eye opener to some people and things that, you know, my life has, I don't just talk about music, I talk about my life, the journey of my life, you know, mm. with three months and. Um, children and living in LA living in Australia in England and 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 the traumas that I've experienced you know I've had the peaks and troughs in my life I've had the the downs as long as well as the ups I've had all the downs and um and I've always looked upon even from the very first one that really affected me was the loss of my father in a car accident I uh uh, trying to come to terms with it, you know, because he was such a, a great, great man and um, he was so loved by people and uh, I couldn't work it out in my head. You know, why would you take, why would you take him? Why did, why did this happen? And you question these things and then I came to the, to the, the conclusion that all of this was character building. It was meant to be for me. It was a, it was a, a way of, of me having to come through this. Mm. To, to 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 get me to the to the next stage and take that on board um in life and and when you get those you know those things that come at you from from a wide berth you know they they, they hit you um you you, uh, you knock you down and it's you know you got to get up again and um and and i've had quite a few of those and um so I had to always, I've always viewed it as character building and figured, well, as traumatic and as bad as it is, I've had, in a way, I feel it's almost like a, another sort of gift, although it's a dark gift, that by giving you that, um, there must be a reason for it and, and mm -hmm. that you get the strength from it. And um, as I say, you know, they're, they're dark moments, but you, um, but you find, find your way back. And um, I've always been a fighter. So, uh, yeah, I have, I've had to view it like that. And life's had that sort of journey. So in this book, and by the way, the subtitle, as I said, the book is called Oh, What a Life. And that, yeah. the reason for that all is not only sums up that it has been a oh, life, but it's based on a song that I co-wrote with Leo that was on his first album that was really a throwaway song. Um, but it's one that I've always chuckled about because it's constantly on the television because it crops up in an episode of Only Fools and Horses where they've used oh. it in, in Denzel's truck. He's got it on the radio and it always makes me laugh every time I hear it. How and do you thought, feel when, when you hear that and you think, oh, oh yeah, my I, goodness. I'm quite honoured that John Sullivan put it in there. You know, It was a nothing song. It was not like, not like some great melody or anything. It was just a, a up little number anyway um but but I, as a title i felt this says it all mm. being in that show i thought well there's something telling me it's something here that this this should be it because originally my book was going to be called giving it all away which was after the big hit that i wrote you know for roger daltrey and uh, and um i thought no you know although giving it all away and the show must go on they all sort of say all these things but oh what a life I feel that it expresses everything for me because mm, it's, mm. as I say it's not just oh what, a, oh what a fantastic life you know it's always been on the up there are all those those peaks and troughs so mm. that journey is and I felt that that was a great way of expressing it so the book is going to be called oh what a life but there's a subtitle and the subtitle says that nothing in this book is true but it's exactly the way it happened and that's the way that, <laughs> and that's what it is so it's oh what a life <laughs> subtitle nothing in this book is true but it's exactly the way it happened so take it from there that'll that'll give you a clue i'm going to think <laughs> about that now that yeah. that's intrigued me i'm going to think about that and um that's very interesting david yeah so uh, that's and like, it is it is everything is there is true <laughs> But as I'm saying, I've I've turned it on its head there, but mm. it's exactly the way it happened, yeah. So there you are. Wonderful. And when is that coming out? At the end of the year? 
Yeah, it'll be towards the end of the year. We're just trying to time it out now because of um, two things. One is because of what's been going on, of, uh, of being aware of what would be a, a good window of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Usually we don't release anything in the summer months because people are away on vacation, but they're not going to mm. be there. That's not going to be the case this year. So, do you bring it earlier? So, because you know people are going to be have more time to 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 get indul ind indulge in it, or do you leave it until a bit later? And then I have to think about the isolation symphony of tying it up so that the two come together. And, yes. Um, um, because you know, at the same time you're hearing the latest thing that I've done, it, you, you often want to be reflecting on how you got there, and like we've discussed this this evening. Mm. So mm. I think bringing them all together is is the right thing. So it's finding that right moment, and you know, it always comes back to the same old thing, which is what not just business is based on, but life in general, and that is timing. Everything is timing. You know, you can come too early or too late. You've got to be on that moment and, um, and in that moment. And that's what you always strive to try and find, that window of <laughs> opportunity, that right window. And um, so I'm sort of being involved with when, when, when this should come out, you know. Well, I understand what you're saying because it has to be also relevant to the moment. Yes. Which is that um, we're coming through this. Where it's going to take us, we don't know. Right. So, uh, although it's a poignant moment now, really, because everyone is coming out of lockdown, everyone is uncertain of what is going to be going on and where this is, you know, where this road is taking us. Mm. So, I think we need something. We need some hope. We need something to get yes. us through it absolutely by the way did you ever watch the video that we put together that went with that single no i didn't yeah. see that oh, well i must send you the youtube on it. you'll find it on youtube if you're is it the Courtney, one with I... your is it the one with the um poetry on it no it's got no poetry in it no this is um uh, this is those those three tracks that you've You've heard the mm. isolation. Symphony. They uh, there's a video that goes with that, and it, and, it, and yeah, you should you should take a look at that because you'll you'll enjoy that. It, again, it's only about two minutes something odd long. It's not very long, maybe just under four minutes, maybe. But um, you take three, a look. I'm I, I'm not sure now, you know, because I was so into the whole thing, and it took me on this, as I said to you, on this whole new otherworldly place that oh. I, I sort of lost a sense of here and now because really I have to say to the listeners it's something that really is incredible how it can every part of it takes you to another place this is what I like I like this type of music so but I will I'm going to have a look through the whole thing again because I love oh, it I'll, I really do I'll send you I'll send you the link but if you know for those uh, I can't send everybody the link but uh, basically yeah. if, if you my name and you've got isolation symphony and you go on youtube you should find it <laughs> all right then now as we come to a close it's been an absolute pleasure really david to have you here tonight um i always ask my guests this what sort of words of wisdom would you give to the listeners now especially in these times that we are in that have helped you through life, you know, helped you through those ups and downs that you speak of and really never to give up hope. What has helped you? Yeah, um, I guess, as I said earlier on, you know, with, you get knocked down and you have to get back up again and you've got to find the strength, the inner strength to do it and the belief and the, and the faith that you've got to have in yourself. Uh, uh, to, to fight through it. and I did when I spoke to you the other day I said to you there was always one famous quote that I've always um, uh, liked by a, a man called Calvin Coolidge who was a, a US president in the early days and he wrote these this quotation called press on and yeah. the point of the, of the quotation if you want to read it is um, is that persistence is the key word you know, you know that, that is that is it. Keep keep going. Keep trying. Mm -hmm. And and I guess that's what Churchill was was all about. You know, it was never give up. Keep going. Keep knocking at the door. And th yeah. that's what I've always done. And 
it's it's not easy because it's so easy to throw the towel in sometimes you think oh, i can't do this anymore i've just had enough uh I feel so beaten up but um for some reason and again there may be some sort of i guess a gift that i've mm -hmm. been given is to be able to fight my way back and uh, because i believe in myself and and most of all i believe in in the, the joys of life so uh, it's um that's what's inspired me to keep keep me going and uh when you read the book you'll see that when i've hit those dark moments of how i've had to get myself out of it and come back and there's been a few so yeah so persistence and and belief i guess you know yeah that's the other thing and and of course if you've got love around you you know that'll give you the strength in itself because uh there are many that don't have it around them and that's so they're really alone, you know, so it's even harder if you've got no love around mm. you. But, mm. so, it's very true. Yeah. So, you know, where the there's magic the ingredient, life. the magic ingredient, isn't it? Love. Yeah. The ingredient really for everything that we touch, everything that we do, if there's no love in it, I think it becomes pointless and tasteless. Yeah. But if we have love, then really there is a whole divinity within us that we can experience in each moment of our life isn't it absolutely absolutely yeah mm. and as I say, mm. where there's dark there's light you know that that's, yeah. that's the thing and that's what i've tried to express with this this album to show you know there's that darkness that we've come through here and, and we're heading towards the light and um so uh yeah that's that's the way it is for me and i yes. hope it is for everybody else out there and we we need your book. I think we need your book sooner rather than later, actually, David, because <laughs> yeah, it would be it would it's so needed. Now is the time that I would go and pick that book up. So I'm waiting for it because now is the time that people need this. We need a hand. Yeah, we need a helping well, hand. Yeah, to say it's making that decision. You know, um, mm. to, to yeah. with the idea, and I want to bring them both together, and the the. Um, the book has, has really been written and being edited as we speak. Um, so that's not going to be too long before that's ready and dusted and ready to go. And the album is um, the final mix of that album is happening this Friday. So that'll be in the can very, very quickly. So it, I could come earlier than if I wanted to. I could do it. Um, mm. Day, you know it's just, it's just that timing thing you don't want to you know you know as, as as Macmillan said when it came to politics when he was asked what dictates politics and he said mm. event events and that's what the world is about because you know like yeah. this, this late and no one could see this coming so you know it overshadowed everything prior to this or oh, the only other word we ever used to hear every day was brexit and then suddenly this hit it and it's the brexit it's like history you don't even hear the word so no, it's, it's like it never existed yeah so mm. you know if i come with something you know and you as much as you think oh right okay i'm going to do it right now and because you never know what's coming around the corner and something that can overshadow the whole thing and you you would have been on the front page, and now you're knocked because something has superseded it. Yeah, know, has, has yeah. taken it. But that can happen, I guess, at any time. So we're always vulnerable to that. But uh, yeah, look, um, yeah, no, it gave me great pleasure to see it out there, so I can talk more about it as people are experiencing it. Absolutely, and, and you have to come again because then well, we're, we're going to do the talk we're about gonna the do book. The book. Well, we're going to walk through the album as well. We're we going to do that. We are. Yeah. We are. There's there's a couple of beautiful things there that we can do, and it can really, you know, um, give you know an astounding experience to the listeners and to myself. I have to say, and I'm very much looking forward to it. So, right. David, um, where can people get hold of you? Where can they get hold of me? <laughs> Around yes. by the neck. Um, <laughs> if they got, want to find out more about your work oh well you, um, you can go to my website david mm -hmm. davidcourtney.co.uk yeah it's mm -hmm. there yeah i'm there yes and um i'm on facebook and all those those things you know so uh yeah but the website is is a, is a good way of finding out the walk of fame is you can see that out there as well um 
yeah, it's 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 all there for the taking. <laughs> and it's and is the Walk of Fame. It's on your. It talks about it on your website, doesn't it? As well. Yeah, it does. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, mm. if you if you put walkoffame.co.uk in in your uh, in your address bar, it'll take you to our other company, which is really the company now. It's called Fame Media Tech, and and through that you can see all the various things. Of, including the Bollywood thing and uh, the music walk of fame and all that. So if you, if you go on that, you'll, um, you'll find it all. There. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you again, David, for, Pleasure. you know, joining me tonight. It really, I have really, really enjoyed talking to you Pleasure. and Pleasure. amazing, amazing work that you have done and really I'm blessed to have you here on the show tonight, I have to say. Thank you, Mamie. It's very kind of you. Thank you. And um, we'll have to arrange for you to come on again. And we'll, yeah. we will put that in the diary at some point. Yeah, and, I'll keep you um, posted. Yes, keep me posted. But thank you again. And I wish you every success in everything that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. And, and uh, for you and all your all your listeners out there, please stay safe and stay well. Oh, all right then. Well, take care and we'll speak soon. God bless. Thank you. All right. Bye. 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 David Courtney. Amazing. I am so thrilled to have had him here on the show today. Wonderful. Wonderful. And thank you for joining us and sharing these really precious moments in time. I really appreciate you all. And thank you sincerely from my heart. Until next time, take care and lots of love. Thank you for listening to Secrets for an Inspirational Life, brought to you by your host, Mimi Novik. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and see you in the next episode. For more information about Mimi Novik and her books, music and inspirational work, take a look at her website, www.miminovic.co.uk.